Joining me is the panel, Simon Brini, Director of Policy at the Institute of Public Affairs, and Daisy Cousins, columnist and contributor to the Spectator Australia and Quadrant magazine. Daisy, that's... Uh, what, uh, we've, we've got politics in turmoil. We don't know whether the, the Senate is duly elected and can pass laws, or indeed the lower house, and, the, and, and we're told, oh, just wait, guys, for three more months, essentially. <laughs> huh? <laughs> look, I think this is a headache for the government, whichever way you look at it. I mean, as, aside from the obvious fact that they might have to delay their legislative agenda, which is a pain in the neck, um, it quite obviously it calls into question the legitimacy of the votes of these particular MPs. I mean, for example, if legislation goes through with, say, the vote of Barnaby Joyce that would have failed um, if he didn't vote for it, and then all of a sudden he's disqualified, well, that could could call the entire validity of the legislation into question, which is a huge problem, and it's not something the government needs at the moment, certainly not. Simon, two months before it even hears the case, I mean, I know that it was told by uh, One Nation's uh, Malcolm Roberts that oh, he couldn't possibly get his case in, in order in two months. Surely they could have said, come on. Look, um, you know, in the normal course of events, you've got to allow for people to put together legal cases. You want to be able to hear both sides of an argument and you want for judges to be able to make a decision. But frankly, we're in a position where we're, all, we're right on the verge of a constitutional crisis. I mean, Daisy's right. Mm. There's any number of pieces of legislation that will come before both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, we've got enough numbers on either side of these debates that could be determined by the eligibility of these senators and members Correct. of the House of Reps. So I think it's incumbent on the High Court to make a decision earlier than this. I think, frankly, the fact that we've got to wait until the 10th of October is not good enough. That's just for the hearings, right? Exactly. Because then they've got exactly. to decide and write the decisions, and I think they're all writing quills now still, don't they? So th that will take, take forever. It can take a very long time. Yeah. It can take a very long time. I think this is a terrible mess. Now, while this... Um, this, uh, we've also got someone else in the mess, actually, Daisy. Mm. Uh, Nick Warner, head of the Australian Secret Intelligence Service. Uh, he won't be feeling, he'll be feeling a bit shabby today, too. He was photographed giving a fist pump with the Philippines president, Rodrigo Duterte, who's ordered drug dealers, notoriously drug dealers, or people he calls drug dealers, to be shot dead in the street. Hundreds, apparently, have uh, copped a bullet. Now, that clenched fist is Duterte's uh, trademark. You know, tough. And Labor says that, you know, Warner's actions in doing it for, with him are inappropriate and a serious misjudgment. What do you reckon? Well, look, far be it for me to agree with Labor on anything, but uh, in, in this particular case, I, I do think it was a serious uh, error in judgment. The thing, the thing about the iron fist, it's, it's not just a symbol of, of power, it's a symbol of defiance, and it represents Duterte's iron fist approach to crime. And if you want an example of that, there's actually been a bit of backlash to his war on, war on crime and war on drugs. Last week, there was a 17-year-old boy who was shot by undercover policemen during a raid. Uh, they uh, gave him a gun and told him to run, but even as he ran, they shot him anyway in the back of the head after, mm -hmm. you know, giving... It's, it's, absolutely hor it's absolutely horrible. And he allegedly uh, pleaded with them to let him go because he had to go to school the next day. So when, when you hear stories like that and, and you see Nick Warner effectively cozying up symbolically to this regime, I... I'm, I'm sorry, I am going to have to agree with Labor here for the first time probably ever, and maybe the last time. This was an error in judgment, and it, it, I'm very sorry that this happened. Look, Daisy makes a really strong case uh, there, Simon. Uh, I can imagine it's really tough. Yeah, there is obviously Nick Warner's there to ask for cooperation yeah. in the yeah. national interest. He wants to go along with the guard because he wants us, our interests, furthered. Uh, it's a little hard then to say when the president says, "Give me the fist," yeah, for the yeah. F to say, "No, I can't do that." Yeah, exactly but, right. But and exactly but. right. What do you reckon? I think, I think that is that is um, the conundrum that was faced by Warner when he was asked by the president to do this. Frankly, I think it's incumbent on him to say no. I think he can say no, and he can recognise that yes, the relationship's important. We're not being virtue signalers here, but. I think he can. I think he can say no. I mean, look, I, I'm not as fussed about it as a lot of people are. No. I, I think Duterte is a, a violent, murderous thug, um, but at the same time, you've got to recognise that 
intelligence officials, other officials from the government are going to have to work with officials that we don't like around the world in other parts of the... And Nick Warner would have Australia's interests at heart and do what you can. Yeah. Well, I don't it's know. It's, uh, it's, it, to me, it's a little bit uh, messy. Now, but talk about uh, inappropriate, um, Daisy. Uh, 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 Tony Abbott. I don't know why it's now he's admitting, eight years on, that he slept through a vote on Kevin Rudd's stimulus package because he was so drunk he passed out and didn't turn up. Now, um, this puzzles me why he would admit it now after being huffy about being asked about it until then. How do you think this is going to play out? I think it's a little odd that he's finally come out and admitted it. Um, whilst I think it's a little bit unbecoming, I don't think it will hurt him in the long run, which is what a, you know, a few people are sort of saying. I think he has, he has a lot of grassroots support, he has a lot of loyalty within the party, in the, the right-wing faction and also in the, in the general public, and uh, whilst he, I, I am puzzled as to why you would admit this so far down the track, I I think he's going to come out of it all right. I think people will forgive and forget. You know, it's, it, at one level, it's sort of like a category error, some, mm. to think of Tony Abbott so undisciplined that he's drunk. But, you know, he's a, a, a very enthusiastic kind of guy, and the more you know him, the more you can imagine that might... Maybe that did happen. Oh, but yeah, it, how yeah, would yeah. the public was see... Will they see him differently? No, well, well, they might, but I, frankly, I think it's probably a positive thing. I mean, I, I think positive. Australians... Australians think is is that the IPA view, that uh, the more drunks, the better? <laughs> no, 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 no. But I think, I think Australians look at politicians and they think, you know, that's a category of people that are pretty straight-laced, right? And if they do things like most people do... A lot of Australians have a bit much to drink from time to time and they might do what Tony Abbott has done. And so I think they see a bit of themselves in him. Um, you know, more of this sort of honesty and openness and more of this human uh, element of politics, I think, is a good thing. And I don't think we trust the pure, Daisy. I don't think the pure we trust. We always look for someone to declare a weakness so that we've, we think we've got their measure. And maybe it's better to declare, hey, I got drunk once eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's not too bad. No, you know, you know what, I, I think I agree with you and I, and I agree with, with Simon. Politicians, some, they come across almost as robots somehow in how perfect they try to be all the time. And, and we, we're all flawed as human beings. And, and for Tony Abbott to admit that, and let's face it, it was a very stressful time. Um, yeah, I, I think as Australians we might almost find that endearing. Almost find it endearing. <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost. Hey, listen, no, I've got 30, 30 <laughs> seconds, uh, Simon. The Burka ban. Uh, we had a poll today, Sky News, um, Richtel, 57% support from the public. The media class, of course, was 99% yeah. against yeah. it. How do you get, explain that divide? Oh, I mean, it's the same sort of trend you see happening right across politics in the Western world. I think, uh, for the most part, those in the political and media class are, um, have got a pretty different set of values from those in uh, most parts of the country, and that includes voters. And in this case, I'm frankly not all that surprised to see this. I think most people are pretty uncomfortable with the burqa. Um, you know, whether they think that the state should actually step in and say um, they should ban it, you know, I'm not, not sure. I, how I suspect that. the poll really was do. Yeah, I mean, in their minds they were saying, I don't like it, exactly. rather than necessarily ban it. Exactly. I, I was just thinking it's one of those divided things. The pylon on Pauline Hanson I thought was right over the top. Uh, Simon Brini, Daisy Cousins, thank you so much both for your time. Thank you for having me.